Back in the heyday of the analog era, magnetic tape was the medium for recording, but the distribution of music and other audio material was primarily on vinyl disc. At that time, mastering was mainly concerned with getting the sound on tape, the completed mix, onto the somewhat more restricted medium of vinyl records. Tape generally has a wider dynamic range than vinyl, and vinyl playback is subject to mechanical issues that have to be anticipated to ensure reliable playback without tracking and skipping problems. And the process of cutting a vinyl master is prone to failure for even a single glitch, an expensive exercise making it critical to ensure that the audio signal is properly prepared for those challenges. Even today, the resurgence in vinyl distribution, though it is a niche market in overall music distribution, has brought those concerns back, at least for those who opt for a vinyl release. Back in the day, mastering had to be handled by a dedicated mastering engineer with a collection of hardware specifically geared to that process. Incidentally, this is still true today for many commercial releases, even though software tools are now available to and used by the masses. For vinyl mastering, the audio is often compressed to help wide dynamic swings on tape fit into the slightly more restrictive dynamic range of the vinyl medium. At the time, the compression was not intended to necessarily punch up the audio, as it often is nowadays, but to simply control the dynamics, ideally without any noticeable change from the master tape. Back then, dynamic processing at the mastering stage was also needed to prepare the audio for the unique considerations of creating a master disc for vinyl duplication. The waveform on tape is cut into the single groove of a metal master disc, which is then used to replicate the actual vinyl discs distributed to the public. The stylus cuts the shape of the wave into the groove in real time, and since even a single jump or over-excursion will turn the master into a doorstop, the compression and limiting must be carefully set to prevent this. Low frequency information in the audio wave, especially on one side of the stereo wave, is more likely to cause problems, so EQ may be applied to anticipate any potential issues, and often the lows are reduced to mono and pan to the center to help tracking in both cutting and later vinyl playback. A special standardized EQ curve, the RIAA curve, is applied during cutting, which will be precisely reversed in playback on all systems to restore flat response. All of these issues and processes were the concern of the mastering engineer when vinyl was the primary medium, but when digital distribution took over, first CDs and eventually digital downloads and streaming, different concerns took over, and the mastering process changed accordingly. Instead of being a simply technical exercise, mastering gradually became more of a creative process. The same types of processing were employed, but now they were often used to subtly improve on the finished mix, to add presence and punch, as well as for the more traditional tasks of checking for and eliminating potential technical problems. The main tools used in modern mastering are EQ, compression, and limiting. Since they're being used on the full mix, affecting all elements of the mix, these processes are applied much more subtly than they would be at the mixing stage, where they'd be applied to individual elements in a production. EQ is typically used to add presence and clarity, so if the mastered track is heard in less-than-ideal playback environments, the listener will still enjoy good clarity and intelligibility. Compression is applied not only to control overall dynamics of a mix, but to give the audio a little extra push. Again, this can help low-level passages come through more clearly in noisy listening environments, but the compression is also commonly used to make the mix more aggressive and more likely to draw in and envelop the listener. For many years now, a big part of mastering has been to use brick wall limiting, a purely digital process, as the final mastering stage to push the average level of recordings to be as loud as possible, theoretically to help them stand out in radio play or streaming, again, drawing the listener in more effectively. This practice has been dubbed the loudness war, and many, many people feel it's gone too far. In fact, the current trend is to shoot for slightly lower, more reasonable average levels, especially for product intended for streaming. But loudness maximizing, as it's called, is still practiced when mastering for some media, like CDs, which are still widely distributed, and the modern mastering engineer may end up making different versions of the final product to suit different distribution formats. These three main tools are applied sequentially, with the brick wall limiter as the last plugin. However, they may or may not be chained in the same order as they would be on a track and a mix. Many mixers prefer to place compression ahead of EQ, so dialing up large tonal changes doesn't necessitate resetting the compression threshold. Of course, that's not a hard and fast rule, just a common approach. In mastering, often the EQ is placed ahead of the compression, 
Since mastering applications usually call for a much more subtle application of all processes, small EQ tweaks of a dB or two are unlikely to require changes to a compressor that follows. But again, not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes a multiband compressor is used as opposed to a regular single band compressor, and subtle tonal rebalancing may be achieved by different settings in the different bands, negating the need for a dedicated EQ. It all depends on the particular track and the judgment of the mastering engineer. Sometimes other processing may also be used in mastering, like exciters to help a band limited track, or even reverb or ambience to add a little subtle depth to an overly dry mix. Most of the time, this won't be necessary and the three main processors will be all that's needed, but on occasion a little more work may need to be done, and so these tools can also be considered part of a mastering engineer's toolbox. Before any mastering session is concluded, the mastering engineer will want to check for potential problems like phase issues or image and frequency imbalances. A suitable collection of metering tools should always be used to perform that final check with any technical issues addressed before the final master is bounced and released. So that's a fairly simple overview of both the evolution of mastering and the basics of the process in modern mastering sessions. Throughout the course, we'll look at typical approaches for setting up and processing tracks in a mastering session, but first I want to go through the various tools provided in Logic for addressing mastering needs. I'll start with Logic's EQs.